so we're going to get started uh, without further ado. Question 11. This is a 28-year-old football player, sustains a displaced posterior glenoid fossa fracture. He elects to undergo ORIF using a posterior approach to the shoulder. What intramuscular interval should be used to expose the posterior glenoid? Uh, and the answer is the teres minor and infraspinatus. Uh, and you can see the uh, description there. We don't need to go through that. We'll show some uh, nice pictures of the uh, posterior approach coming up. So we're going to cover the approaches to the shoulder. So we'll, obviously the deltopectoral approach is going to be the workhorse for probably 95% of most shoulder surgery. The anterolateral approach uh, is sometimes used, for example, in greater tuberosity fractures. Uh, the lateral deltoid splitting approach uh, can be used um, as so-called McKenzie approach or an anterosuperior approach uh, for reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, especially if there's um, been prior deltoid problems. A posterior approach, which is what we just had the question about, and then the Jude approach, which is what I'm going to use for a higher complex uh, uh, scapular, scapular body and displaced uh, uh, intraarticular glenoid fractures. And we'll show some examples of that. Well, the deltopectoral approach, as you all know, is uh, going to be used for almost all of what we do in shoulder surgery from an open approach for arthroplasty, proximal humerus fractures, uh, and the like. Uh, the internervous plane is between the deltoid and the pectoralis major. <clears throat> deltoid comes lateral, pec goes medial. Um, we're going to find the musculocutaneous nerve, usually about five centimeters distal to the coracoid. Always stay lateral to that. If we're doing an operation like a pec transfer uh, for uh, subscap insufficiency, then we have to absolutely identify the musculocutaneous nerve. Um, certainly, don't want to be um, uh, we we don't want to uh, to uh, avoid that nerve. Um, and there's nothing wrong with identifying it and putting a vessel loop around it. <coughs> Excuse me. Cephalic vein, um, this says it should be preserved if possible. I would say more often than not, we ligate the, ner the uh, vein because it just gets in the way and, and uh, uh, it's better to ligate it directly than to have it uh, tear during the uh, procedure. The axillary nerve is obviously at risk uh, just uh, about by the subscapularis tendon. Uh, and we have to always be mindful of that. And the anterior humeral circumflex artery and the three sisters are going to run anteriorly, <coughs> and we're going to coagulate those uh, in virtually all procedures. This is what the surgical steps look like. We'll go through this rather quickly, uh, given the interest of time. For standard skin incision from the coracoid to just um, lateral to the anterior axillary crease. We're going to identify the cephalic vein uh, in those uh, virgin cases uh, with the deltoid lateral and pec medial. Uh, now we've uh, gone down deeper and we can see the uh, strap muscles, the short head of the biceps and the coracobrachialis. Um, and we can retract. Now you have to be careful here uh, if you're a junior resident and you're on the um, retracting here. This is where musculocutaneous nerve neuropraxias can occur, so be very mindful of that. Uh, as we go deeper, now we've done a coracoid osteotomy in this case, if we're, for example, doing a ladder J procedure. The anterolateral approach indications are for uh, cuff repair. Um, in the old days when we used to do this uh, open, we really don't do that much anymore. This incision is probably not exactly uh, accurate. The anterolateral approach is really going to be coming more in this direction. This schematic uh, kind of missed that a little bit. Um, and there is no internervous plane here, so we have to be very careful of the axillary nerve. Um, and so we're going to split the uh, deltoid and perhaps take it off of the anterior chromion, uh, and then you have to repair it. And there's all sorts of controversy on should you leave a cuff of tendon or just do it intramuscular or do it take the muscle off the acromion. But obviously deltoid dehiscence is something we worry a lot about uh, with that procedure. Uh, again, understand the axillary nerve anatomy. The nerve runs transversely across the surface of the deltoid, about seven centimeters distal to the acromion. But remember, that number is variable, and it's also variable based on body size and habitus. So sometimes it can be as close as five centimeters or even four centimeters from that anterolateral acromion, and that's something you have to keep in mind. And of course, we always see the acromial branch of the thoracoacromial artery uh, off the um, anterior part of the deltoid when we're doing arthroscopic acromioplasties. We see that artery in every single case, uh, and we have to coagulate it. So something just to keep uh, in mind from a clinical standpoint. Uh, surgical steps, then, we're going to do the um, superficial dissection, as shown here. Uh, deeper dissection, again, seeing the axillary nerve, 
um, and into the deeper part. We can expose the long head of the biceps. If you're going to do a biceps tenodesis, um, you could do that uh, um, super pectorally, as shown here, or of course we could do it subpectorally. The lateral deltoid splitting approach, that's going to be uh, best for reduction and fixation of greater tuberosity fractures uh, that don't have a concomitant uh, uh, surgical neck component. If you have to do something in the surgical neck and you're doing a lateral approach, uh, deltoid splitting approach, it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, trauma surgeons actually love this approach and they love to identify the nerve and do two windows. Uh, but uh, most shoulder surgeons uh, prefer a deltopectoral approach if you have to do anything down the uh, front of the uh, humeral shaft. So a little bit different there. Um, let's see. Uh, there's no true internervous plane again because we're splitting the deltoid. Uh, and again, we're going to always just keep talking about the axillary nerve. Uh, because that's going to be a real problem. Uh, it runs transversely, again, as we said, five to seven centimeters, but it, depending upon the size of the patient, could be as close as three to five centimeters. So don't take that for granted. And as I said earlier, the trauma surgeons like to make a second window if they're doing an indirect reduction and uh, ORIF uh, with a plate. Uh, but for most of us, I think we prefer a deltopectoral approach uh, for, um, uh, for most proximal humerus fractures. Um, and we're limited distally because, again, the axillary nerve and the deltoid has been split in line of its fibers. And um, there's not really a great option for extension, as we mentioned. Posteriorly, we're not going to be there as much um, as we are on the anterior side. Uh, but for proximal humerus fracture dislocations and, and of course, glenoid fractures and osteotomies, uh, that'll be the most likely um, indication and scapular fractures. And for me, that's going to be the most likely reason that I'm doing an open approach uh, from a posterior side. The internervous plane is between the teres minor and the infraspinatus, uh, as shown here. The axillary nerve, again, running through the quadrangular space beneath the teres minor. So it's important to understand uh, and not get lost posteriorly between the infra and the teres and inadvertently uh, uh, injure the axillary nerve. And of course, we're being mindful of the posterior circumflex humeral artery uh, coming along with that. Uh, so you can make your incision in a lot of different directions. Uh, here we're showing it uh, in a transverse plane. Often I'll make a incision longitudinally along the glenohumeral joint if it's just a straight posterior glenoid fracture or a, posterior, uh, a glenoid osteotomy or a posterior glenoid bone block type procedure. Uh, so probably in most of those cases make more of this longitudinal incision in uh, Langer's lines. Um, here we're showing the, the transverse incision. Here's a superficial dissection. Uh, here we can start to see the deltoid, which has now been retracted, under, showing us the uh, infraspinatus. Remember, the infraspinatus is a bipennate muscle, so that can be very helpful between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And don't get lost here, because this is where you might uh, run into the axillary nerve. Uh, that, uh, by now retracting the infraspinatus out of the way, uh, either by taking it off, uh, usually with a cuff of tissue, similar to what we do with the subscap, we're now right on the posterior glenohumeral capsule. Uh, incising the capsule exposes the joint, and then we can do uh, either a posterior bank card, posterior bony procedure, or whatever operation you're there for. So although we're not there as much posteriorly, it's actually not a difficult approach. You should practice in a cadaver if you've never done this, but you'll find that it's actually fairly straightforward. It's just not something you're as comfortable and familiar with as the anterior approach. And there you see the uh, deep dissection. Now the Judea approach is going to be the, uh, the utilitarian approach for the uh, really bad scapular and posterior glenoid fractures. Uh, and this is going to give you wide exposure uh, to the uh, posterior glenoid. Um, here we have an internervous plane between the suprascapular nerve of the infraspinatus and the axillary nerve of the teres minor. Uh, the suprascapular nerve anatomy seems to be a, an area of, of uh, interest for questions on the in-training and on boards. Uh, remember that suprascapular nerve anatomy as it comes underneath the transverse scapular ligament. The artery usually goes over the, the ligament, but not always, so there's a lot of variable anatomy here uh, and then the branch the, of the um, uh, infras to the infraspinatus comes below 
uh, the uh, scapular spine um, at the spinal glenoid notch. And this is where uh, cysts can form from a slap tear causing compression of the, um, uh, to the, either if it comes up high, it can get both the super and infraspinatus, or if it's lower, it might only preferentially uh, get the, um, the branch to the infraspinatus, and you might have infraspinatus uh, preferential weakness. The other thing that can happen in volleyball players is that they can get uh, preferential uh, loss of infraspinatus uh, and infraspinatus atrophy uh, due to a, a, um, uh, a paradoxical increase hypertrophy of the infraspinatus because of their volleyball playing, and then they actually cause a compression neuropathy around the, the um, spinal glenoid notch, uh, causing uh, alt, uh, later atrophy. So it's an unusual condition, but it's been reported uh, by Michael Sandow in Australia as uh, one of the reasons that you might get uh, a suprascapular neuropathy. Uh, the axillary nerve anatomy, again, passes through the quadrangular space and, space and beneath the teres minor and is obviously at risk for injury uh, in these uh, big surgical procedures. Uh, the classic Judea I'm going to show in a moment in a case uh, starts from the posterolateral tip of the acromion and goes along the medial border of the scapula. There's a variety of different variations on the theme, but for my money, if I'm actually doing the, this type of procedure, I would prefer to do uh, a fairly wide exposure so we can expose everything and, and do a, a uh, anatomic reduction. This is a, a case of a 42-year-old patient with a uh, scapular body and displaced uh, intraarticular fracture. <coughs> this shows the classic Jude incision. Uh, you can see starting um, here up at the posterior lateral corner of the acromion and then coming all the way down the medial border of the scapula. It gives you phenomenal exposure. Um, and then as you go deeper, we've now ret retracted the skin flap. I've actually sutured this down to help with exposure. You see the underlying deltoid. Uh, we then take the deltoid off, and then that exposes uh, our underlying uh, infraspinatus uh, and teres minor, as we see. And then we have to be careful up here in the area of the suprascapular nerve and down here in the area of the axillary nerve. So these are the things that you're going to be thinking about uh, as you um, do these approaches. But you can see now with clearing of the scapula, now we're on the uh, lateral border. And remember, the best bone is going to be on the lateral border and the medial aspect up into the scapular spine. So these pre-contoured plates have been nicely designed for scapular fractures after we've done an anatomic reduction. All of this central bone, as you know, excuse me, all of this central bone is paper thin and cannot hold screws. So basically this is going to be a bag of bones in the middle. We're going to fix the lateral side, we're going to fix the medial side, and that's where you're going to get your fixation. So that's really important to, to keep in mind. Um, and there you see a uh, pre-contoured plate along the medial <coughs> right here nicely along the entire medial border and up into the scapular spine taking, um, taking advantage of the best bone stock for screw fixation.